I'm welcoming you to another in a series of interviews for the hard facts about soft skills. And I know some of you have been, I think the back row, a lot of you have been to some of the others in this series. We've had several other topics. <clears throat> I'm Linda Katz-Wilner, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the CEO of Successfully Speaking. I'm a communication and soft skills specialist, and what I do is I help you balance the three V's of communication, as many of you have heard many times. The visual, how you look, the vocal, how you sound, and the verbal, what you say. And when these three are balanced, that's when we come across with a professional presence, <clears throat> and that's when we're credible. So it's important to make sure that how we look, and I don't mean just the dress, Although when you wear flashy socks, that says something about you. No, no Chris's <laughs> socks. That's another whole story. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but it's not just how you look, but it's how you carry yourself and when you walk into a room and when you're networking. When I thought about sales and leadership, I started thinking about the fact that those who are successful have mastered, hopefully, their soft skills. And when Chris and I spoke, when we first met and spoke about what we both do, there's such an overlap. And if you look at some of these signs on the wall, you'll see how much is related to communication and language. And there are other aspects as well, but there's such a connection in what we do. So I thought it would be wonderful to interview Chris because he knows all about sales and leadership. I can't really welcome him because this is his location, right? So we're here and he's hosting the location. But to start with, and we want this to be informal yeah. for those of you who have heard me talk before, let it be a conversation. Ask questions if you want. Welcome. <clears throat> but I'd like to welcome Chris and first start with just hearing, Chris, how you got to where you are and you have this beautiful facility and thank you for hosting it here. But how did you get to where you are, where now you are training people in sales and leadership? Thank you, Linda, and welcome everybody to our training center. Um, started this business 11 years ago, and, and before that, I spent about 20 years in consumer financial services, mostly with Citigroup uh, and Morgan Stanley. And in 2008, if you think back to that time and place in 2008, the financial markets were slightly dicey, to say the least, and at that point in time, we shut down our whole platform at Morgan Stanley. So as far as vulnerability and, and understanding how that was gonna affect me, it, it, was, it was a tough thing, myself and a thousand other people. So I found Sandler Training completely by accident, if you will, uh, looking up on the internet um, and made the decision after about three months to start McDonald Consulting Group and, and we became an authorized licensee of Sandler Training. And over the last 11 years, uh, we work with businesses, small, medium, and large, uh, in typically four different areas. Uh, the skills, mm -hmm. what are the skills needed for, that, for those businesses to be successful? Are the right people in the right seats uh, on the right bus, if you will? And that kind of gets us into staff, the second S. And then structure and strategy. What's the structure of that business all about? Um, do they have an outside sales force? Do they have an inside sales force? Do they have a, if they're in manufacturing, uh, does their supply chain and engineering and sales, are they all in silos or do they communicate with each other um, and are they working together in the right ways? So we work with companies on those four S's. Okay. And you already said, are they communicating with each other? So let's talk about the soft skills. What are the soft skills that are needed for sales and leadership? Great question. And, and I think it really goes back to uh, two things. One, understanding the difference between hard skills and soft skills. For example, uh, in sales, a hard skill would be, I need to know everything about my products and services. I need to know all the technical aspects of everything that, that I do. The soft skills around that are when they're meeting with the prospect or when they're meeting with uh, a, a current customer to be able to bond, rapport, build trust, uh, to be able to actively listen uh, to that prospect versus just kind of someone saying, tell me why we should buy from you, and them saying, well, because we have the best this, we have the best that, and we have the technical knowledge of this and that, and like we'll talk about a little bit, in today's marketplace, odds favor that most people already know those things, and they can find those things readily available. 
So the soft skills, there's a huge difference in sales. And leadership, to your point, um, I, I, I compare it to a leader, the difference between being an expert and a coach. So sometimes leaders, they feel that the hard skills would be, I know how to do this, therefore you should know how to do this, I'm gonna tell you how to do this, here's the process, here's the procedure, and why do you, why, you need to do it this way or do it that way. The coach may ask questions. The coach may realize what that, that person's um, style is. They may say something like, Eric, what was your thought process when you decided to, uh, to go this route with the customer? Can you help me understand that? Versus the expert, Eric, you shouldn't have done this. You should do it this way using those hard skills. So it's more engagement mm -hmm. for that leader. And, and I hear that all the time because I co coach or work with a lot of people around the world. And sometimes their manager will say to me, can you make sure he understands as a leader, he's not supposed to walk into that meeting and tell the team what to do. Yeah. He needs to ask the questions and he'll, he may find that they have better solutions than he does. Oh, yeah. And that's in his professional development, that was an important skill to learn to ask questions and listen, not just delegate, which most people who are experts in their field feel they want to do. Oh, yeah. We all we all want to do Showcase that. that we, know, we think we know better, right? But we don't. We don't. Now, sales has changed a lot mm -hmm. over the past, let's say, 30 years. Mm -hmm. How has it changed? Linda, I want to I put that out to the group. Um, in, in, in general, do you think sales is harder or easier today? What do you all think? What's that? She didn't hear the question. Is sales harder or easier today? A combination. Larry has an answer. Okay. I think it's harder because most things now are commoditized. Because you can find just about anything you want to buy on the internet, whether that's consulting services, videography services, graphic services. Your, your competition now. The, the playing through the, the barriers to entry have been lower to most products and services. Very much so. Very, very much so. And overall, that, that is the case. And I'll, I'll share a quick story. Um, 30 some years ago, um, I remember with, with my parents, um, this is over 30 years ago, we got in our orange uh, AMC Gremlin, if anyone remembers those vehicles, okay? <laughs> And we went to Sears to buy this new contraption. And speaking of a commodity, it's an easy way to talk about it. It's a microwave oven. We went in, and all this salesperson did was use all of his hard skills. It does this. It has this many BTUs. Let me put this water in here. Watch it boil. Mind blown. I mean, so we were just like, wow, because we didn't have this knowledge before we walked into the store. We had no idea. So we were blown away by what this thing did. So we bring it home. Now, today, you decide, again, to make it easy, thinking about this microwave, you decide to buy a microwave oven today, what's the first thing you do? Best microwave oven or 250. Within five minutes, you are an instant expert on all of that knowledge. Now imagine you walked into the store, right? And then that salesperson continues to tell you the same stuff that you already know. What value is that salesperson giving you? Really, relatively none, because mm -hmm. you basically have that information. So the soft skills today, the ability to engage, the ability to build trust, the ability to separate yourself from the competition, that's where sales, uh, the sales process and being able to ask those sometimes very tough questions mm -hmm. comes into play, and that requires soft skills. And we often have the stereotype, let's say, if we're going to buy a car, same type of thing. Mm -hmm. There's always been a bad reputation or a difficult <clears throat> reputation with car salesmen because yeah. that's the case. And it seems like the ones who ask you about yourself and connect with you, and if you like them, you may buy from them, even though there's another dealership that may have a similar deal. Right? So you start to, it starts to become a people. Sales is more about people and interacting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why is it that people often feel uncomfortable with salespeople? <laughs> Great question. So I'll ask the group, how many in this room love, when you're with the salesperson, you feel like you're being sold to? Raise your hand. No one, go figures. 
-hmm. okay, because mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's uncomfortable it's because of those preconceived notions that we all have about salespeople. Mm -hmm. What are they going to push on me? What are they going to make me buy? What are they going to say that they can't get anywhere else? Buy now and all those different things. And they go back to that stereotypical salesperson. There's a lack of trust, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So when a salesperson goes down a path of just looking and feeling and sounding, like every other salesperson that that person has been with, then those preconceived notions come in. In order to build that trust, the salesperson has to, for, for example, buzzwords. And buzzwords in any business, if it's a technical business or financial services business, whatever it is, they may use certain buzzwords to be able to say, well, your, your ROI and your, your KPI and your flux capacitor and this, that, and the other, or whatever it is, you know, just mm -hmm. blowing someone away with all this incredible knowledge and then the prospect's like, okay, I'm not really sure what they're saying, but I don't want to sound dumb, so I'm not going to ask anything. Mm -hmm. And then all, the trust starts to erode. Mm -hmm. Instead of making it real and having conversations, um, we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but active listening mm -hmm. is one of the most um, basic human needs to be heard and understood. And oftentimes in sales and in leadership, it's so easy to think, well, I, I just heard what that person said, so I don't need to let them know that I heard it. I can just keep on going without confirming or letting them know what I hear you saying is, Linda, blah, 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 blah. Is that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And we can talk about listening skills now. That's one of, yeah, my, one of my favorite topics anyway, but that's true. I mean, I know even recently when we bought a car, <laughs> suddenly, without a lot of planning, but I had done a little bit of research, but I didn't know... We were buying the car that week. I thought it was going to be in the next few months, but things happen. That it was important for that salesperson to really listen to us. And Larry, having been somebody in sales for his whole life, it was wonderful to watch how people in sales know how to talk. I mean, there is a whole language, which we can actually get into, and a way of negotiating and talking to somebody. But the person has to really hear what we want. You know, we may not have wanted all the bells and whistles and to look flashy, and somebody might want that. But if he kept throwing those things out us, at us, we probably would have left and gone to another dealership. Sure. So he had to know, he had to be listening to us. And incidentally, this person, we were, I think, his first sale. And he, when he went on the, when we went on the drive, the test drive, he didn't even know the area, and he said, I've really never done this before. Talk about a little bit of vulnerability and authenticity, but he, he wasn't a really a very well-groomed salesperson, but you get to see the good and the, the not so good with well, sales. Without a doubt, yeah. So there, there are all different flavors and types when it oh, comes yes. to sales. And, and when I think of sales, or I, when I used to think of sales, I thought of car salesmen, people in retail. That was sales. But I think sales goes a lot beyond that, right? Organizations, there's sales and leadership go together, but talk a little bit about the value of having somebody in sales in an organization. Like, what is their role? Absolutely, Linda. And, and it, it, sales has evolved in many ways, and, and there's many different sales processes out there. Uh, there's some that are more designed for a shorter sales cycle, could be more of a uh, commodity type sale. And then there's others that have very, very long sales cycles. Could be capital equipment, capital expenditures for a business with investments that exceed you know, several hundred thousand dollars that are in multi-level um, multi decision makers, complex buying markets, a lot of people involved. And that takes um, more of a team selling approach. Uh, a lot of our clients there's, um, are in that, uh, in that area where the sales team has to be able to, from the very beginning, have a process. Know when they want to bring in different, um, someone from engineering perhaps, or someone from the back end, or a senior leader, or, or a technical expert on, on that sales call. But really to add value, um, one, of the, one of the most important things to add value on a sales call is to be able to relate to that, to that prospect. And a lot of times the, the relatability, it goes to, it kind of gets overlooked because there's so much pressure and there's pressure to sell and there's pressure to, uh, to make sure that either that person, that prospect um, not only likes them, 
Uh, but the problem with that sometimes is that if a salesperson is just so concerned if the prospect likes them, they may not ask tough questions. They may not set the stage in the beginning of that meeting to be able to say, I'm gonna be asking you a lot of questions during this meeting. Is it okay if I ask you a lot of questions? Because it's important that we discover if there's a fit to work together. And if there is no fit, I want both of us to be able to be comfortable telling the other person, no, that there's no fit. Would you be comfortable telling me that at the end of our meeting today? Just something like that breaks down a lot of those stereotypical preconceived notions mm -hmm. that a, a customer or potential prospect has about a salesperson and they can both be engaged during that meeting mm -hmm. versus hard skills, here's what we can do for you, here's all the different technical things, here's why we're great. So even asking permission or oh. acknowledging makes it seem more like a communication with Absolutely. somebody. Absolutely. That's, that's really important. Yeah. Right. And, and just back, I was thinking as you were talking, back to what I was saying about the salesperson who was so inexperienced. The piece I left out is that he was a real likable person. And so we really forgave him for a lot of his shortcomings because he was likable. And so it would, he did not have the hard skills yet. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he'll have them or maybe he's leaving sales because he may not have been that personality. But there's something about if you have that chemistry with somebody or they connect with you right in the beginning that maybe I'm going to ask you tough questions, then you understand what's the ground rules of the Absolutely. conversation. And that, it, all, it always comes down to communication. Well, and to your point, when you understand those ground rules and at the end of that meeting, some sort of decision needs to be made. Because there's a lot of times where uh, you, because of that uncomfortability, either between the salesperson and the prospect or both, at the end of the meeting, if you're the prospect, you might say, well, Chris, that sounds good. We're going to think it over and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you next week. Salesperson walks out, yes, this is going somewhere. This is great. But there may be a reason that Linda said, I'm going to think this over, get back to you next week, because she doesn't want to hurt my feelings by telling me what? Oh, no. <laughs> so it's safer for her to be at surface level and say, oh, it was very nice. But then when I leave, then it's like, oh, I didn't have the heart to tell him no, mm -hmm. you know, instead of having that real conversation. Right. Right. And then next week, all of a sudden, I don't hear from you. So I call you back. And now I'm kind of like, you can tell in my tone of my voice, hey, Linda, um, hey, we had a great meeting last week. Look forward to hearing from you. Don't hear back. Now I'm chasing Linda. And how much time am I spending, wasting, chasing something that probably that, that really wasn't going to happen yeah. in the first place? And so we can't have that open and honest, trustworthy conversation. I have to welcome that no. Mm -hmm. And then we can have a real conversation. And, and I think that happens all the time because so much of our communication now is through email. I know there's so yeah. many times I may send a proposal or somebody calls me that they're very interested and then I send them a proposal and then I don't hear from them and then I don't hear from them. Just tell me no. I'm okay with no. But that silence of not communicating and not letting me know. So I keep thinking, oh, right, yeah. I'll check with them in two weeks and another two weeks and it's futile. Why would you do it? I mean, maybe it would work because some people say it just takes so many touches and maybe you can talk about that, that if you, if you hear no the first time or you don't get a response the first mm -hmm. time, how far do you go? Absolutely. It's a great, and, and there's, there's a lot of different um, studies that would mm -hmm. say, okay, it could take 10 times, 15 times, 18 times, nine times, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but in today's market, it's really important. It's, so if you ask anybody, when would you rather have a no sooner or later? And most people will say sooner. However, in their actions, a lot of these no's turn out to be a lot later because of that maybe that uncomfortability, that does relate strongly to soft skills. But to be able to know that in today's world, it may be a no now, let's find out if it's a no now. And then over time, could be, um, I, I might ask your permission, hey, would it be okay if we we sent you uh, occasional emails about updates. Mm -hmm. Would it be okay if I revisited this conversation in 60 days? Because, or whatever the time frame is, then you know where you stand. Mm -hmm. And you're not putting something in your pipeline that is really just taking up space. Mm -hmm. And to know what the reason is for the no, it right. could be it's not the right time, or it could be I don't have enough money. Absolutely. And I can't do it. And I get to hear that a lot, especially from different cultures and how they deal with the no. 
Robin? I'd like to ask Chris, how, when you get that, I'll get back to you next week, do you like to set parameters right at that time to say, um, can I re can we revisit this in three days? Can we revisit this in seven days? Is that how you like to handle that? That's sometimes right. I find that to be very good thing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's a great question, and, it, and Robin, it really goes back to even before that, it's like playing a game of chess, um, and it's important that we're both on the same page from the very beginning, and if the salesperson just doesn't really set the agenda in the beginning or, or just starts jumping right into features and benefits in the beginning, then it's harder in the very end to determine what are these next steps. So in the very beginning of that meeting, we're gonna agree what type of next step should happen after this meeting. If there's not a fit, then we won't have any. If there is a fit, probably some things that you're going to do, some things that I may do. And then to your question, if it's uh, next week in a couple of days, then maybe it, it would be good to make a recommendation. Hey, Robin, do you have your calendar on you right now? Why don't we look at our calendars? Let's pull our calendars out. Does this three o'clock on Tuesday work for you for us to have a conversation, whatever the case is? And then with today's technology, I can, we can, I can send you a meeting planner right then and there if it makes sense. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so you set parameters early on that you both communicate about and agree to. Absolutely. And that takes away the ambiguity of waiting for something that might never happen. Yeah. But it sounds like you're deferring to the person by asking them the questions rather than being like, I'm going to get back to you in two weeks. Correct. And then all of a sudden they feel defensive that you're forcing that. Yeah. I have kind of a follow-up question. So when I, a lot of my personal calls that have the first meetings have to be with my phone. My phone, yeah. And so I have a script that I follow and a lot of the things that you're talking about I do. And one of the things is before I start asking the questions, I say, normally we have this conversation and then at the end, we set up a time for a next meeting or the follow-up because I don't want people to be forced into making the decision either because for my business I don't think that's right. We go ahead, we finish the call, it goes well, we make that, we schedule that call and then we're not there. Ah, for the second call? Yes. Okay. Which we've, you know, we, we set it, which I, I to, to, like you said, they have an appointment all that, and then they're not, now sometimes, like I tell, I'm in financial services, part of the reason people come to me is because they're not comfortable doing this stuff, so the idea that they put it off, I completely get. Yeah. So sometimes it's just that, and I've even had conversations with people, that's what it was. But how do you get, what do you do in that kind of situation? Because I've done those steps, I've got them to agree, then the next time comes and then they're not there. It's a great question. And one that has a lot of moving parts, obviously. Um, and, and, and one of the big things in that market, we work with a lot of folks in financial services, is that oftentimes the prospect in that situation, number one, they don't feel like getting uh, the, the task of getting their records together, finding all that stuff, insurance, this, that, and the other, it's very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So it's safer to just ignore your, your meeting uh, and then not show up. So I think dealing with those types of things in the very beginning, to be able to very transparently say, if, if, I, can, um, if I can share with you a few of the things that you may run up against, some of the things that different clients that I've worked with run up against. Number one, it's gonna be hard the next couple of days to gather all this information. Let me share with you a few of the things that my clients that I've worked with for a long time have shared with me to make it easier. Would it be okay if we did that? And then, because that, that's what I find is the number one reason in that market that people miss that second appointment. Great question. And I guess the follow-up or how much do you follow up and send, you know, put it on their calendar and send them reminders and you may do all that and it still doesn't happen. I think to your point, showing the person that you know that it's going to be difficult. Absolutely. That, that it's like, oh, Phil understands me, and I like him. Even though this is going to be tough, I'll make that appointment. Absolutely. Because you made that attempt to, to connect at that level and, and understand what I might be going through. Right. That's a great point. And, and it's the, that's where the hard skills and soft skills mm -hmm. combine. Right. Yeah. Right. Sales, that, just the idea of sales. How many people here are in sales? That's my point, that's my point. Yeah, I came from the field of healthcare, so it was never sales. I was there in the hospital working with whoever needed to be there. But I think sales always had that, there was a little bit of a dirtiness to sales, and I never, you never want to say it. And I think once you go in your own business, or you're working for a business, everything 
yeah. is sales. It just unfortunately has that negative connotation that, no, 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 I'm not sales. I'm, I'm here to help people. But it is all about, I guess everything is about sales. Even networking or just making friendships, it's selling who you are or what you can give to somebody. So I think we have to, I don't know if we can change the word or we just have to change how we feel about it. Well, to your point, uh, and actually some do change the word. They might say um, engagement or, you know, our relationships with our customers. So, but there's no hiding the fact that it's sales. But there's a reason for that because there is a perception that, mm -hmm. that, that everyone has or a lot of people have about that. And to your point, um, there's a quote, and, and a lot of people have said this quote, but the person I'm referring to is Philip Kotler, uh, the Kellogg uh, University, says, uh, the sales team is not the whole company but the whole company is the sales team. Mm -hmm. And that's always resonated with me because as we look at the clients that we work with, um, there's such a, it's so important. For one example, this, this goes off the track of soft skills a little bit, but it's directly related. Having everyone in the company, no matter what their role, on LinkedIn with the company um, information being very succinct about the customer, with the company page, everyone's connected to each other, sharing company page information out there. That's where some of these soft skills start to generate is on social media. Mm -hmm. And then that leads to in-person conversations. Well, everybody is representing the organization. Mm -hmm. right? So if you have somebody in the organization who shows up at networking events and drinks too much, <laughs> they're right. representing the right. organization. Right. So it is still about the soft skills that you're talking about because everybody is selling or representing who they work for be it if they're a good communicator, if they have appropriate conduct in events, if they're a friendly person, all of that, they are represented. So everybody is a salesperson for that organization. Absolutely. Be it social media or the face-to-face -face events. Right. Because I could, I could work with a company and then I see they hired that person to represent them. Maybe they're not the company I thought they were. And so, and I know somebody else told me everything they put on social media is scrutinized by the CEO of their company, that he checks out to make sure what they're putting on LinkedIn is appropriate. Oh yeah. Because it just takes one, one bad apple. And, and, and to your point, uh, someone told me a long time ago, one of my mentors, you cannot not communicate. Mm -hmm. You cannot not communicate. Uh, and there's been many times in my, in my career, either before this, uh, when I was in leadership in the corporate world and, and in this business where someone might say, well, I didn't say anything to him or her. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of different things besides uh, your verbal. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's the, the nonverbal, mm -hmm. the body language, the facial expression, the timing. And that brings me into the next question, which I think is so important. You said you cannot not communicate, but... What about silence and pausing? That's, it is communicating, but it's not verbalizing or vocalizing. And what are your thoughts about silence in sales? I'm with one right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, I knew. <laughs> it's, it's so important. Um, and, and it's one of those things that is, and that leads into with, without, typically like to, people don't like silence because why? Why don't people like silence in general? It's uncomfortable. So they fill it with different things, with the, the uhs, the ums, and all that. The thing, the thing, let's talk about leadership for a moment first, if we can. Mm -hmm. um, let's just, for an example, most, a lot of leaders will, again, rely on their hard skills. Let's just say uh, someone showed up late to work using something very easy. Um, Linda, you were supposed to be here at 8.30 this morning. You showed up at 9. You can't do that. You got to make, when that happens, it's going to mess this up, blah, 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 blah. Are we clear? And you're probably going to go, okay, walk away. That got taken care of. Well, the thing is, what if I back up a little bit and I realize how much silence and pauses me? If I say, Linda, you were expected to be here at 8.30. You arrove at 9. Well, the reason was I got stuck in traffic. Okay. And I, I would have been here on time. I, I'm always on time, but today was just something beyond my control. Now, and I'll stop there. The thing is, I want to start to find out what's going on here. 
Is it ability? Is it motivation? Is it both? And really start to understand, but the only way I can get that is to state what you expected, state what you observed, and do one of the hardest things in life. And it's so hard because we have a lot of good stuff to say, let's face it. As leaders, as salespeople, we've got lots of great stuff to say, but the power of silence, if that other person is not thinking, if the other person can't feel comfortable and have some pressure, it could be, there, there could be a 5, 10 second, 15 second delay, and then all of a sudden, the other person will say something, and then the conversation can move. So pauses in a sales environment, looking at, at a prospect and be able to say, Eric, I'm struggling a little bit to understand what you mentioned earlier about your business. You had said, now just that right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm not worried about filling it with, with such, a, but I want, you, I want to, you to realize that I'm taking this seriously, it's genuine, uh, and that we, we, I want to know more about what's happening in your world. It sounds like the fast-talking salesperson or the used car salesman versus the one who's quiet. And then the words that come out are so much more intentional. And they mean so much more. And I think people struggle with this, especially I work with a lot of non-native speakers. They're speaking English as a second language. And in their mind, they want to sound proficient, so they just keep talking and they just keep saying their information. And, um, uh, and then they're translating as uh, they're talking. And there's no quiet. And it's that fire hose of verbiage that's coming at you, and then nothing stands out as important. Right. And when they learn to pause, that does eliminate those fillers, but they say they can think better. So we're, we're giving not just the audience, the, our listener a gift, we're giving ourselves a gift because it slows down the pace and becomes more real, right? So the Absolutely. way you just demonstrated with Eric, it's like, well, Chris, he doesn't have his script. He's not talking from a script mm -hmm. if he says he's struggling. So right. that, that, and then I feel more of a connection, like, oh, okay, he's not telling me what he told the next person and the next person. It's a conversation. Absolutely. But pauses, they're very, yeah. they're very struggle. They're, it's a struggle for people to do that, but therapists do that all the time. Right? They don't tell, you don't go there to have them talk to you. Silence is unbearable sometimes, but then I guess you feel you better say something. Because right. they're not talking. Right. So what, what do you do? Is this a contest, a standoff? So we talked a little bit about the, the word fillers, but what about the good things, the power phrases mm. that you can use? You know, I, I know, well, I'm not going to say what I think. I want to hear what you think, Chris. I, again, I know what I think, so if I'm a good communicator, I'm going to listen to somebody else and learn from them. And so tell me a little bit about power phrases or what words you tell people to use that are more active than sure. weak phrases. Absolutely. Uh, and, and some of the power phrases that, I'm, that I'll mention may seem a little um, like a 180 from, from certain power phrases. Um, for, for a leader, for example, one of the most powerful three words uh, that, that I found over time are, I need, four words, I need your help. I need your help. And, and it's, it's, it could be coaching around a very difficult issue. Um, and it could be uh, explaining something. And a lot of times, in ment leaders will either be in mentor mode, coach mode, supervisory mode, uh, or training mode. And a lot of times, the, the team member doesn't really understand which mode they're in, and there's confusion there. But the words, I need your help. Help me understand what your thought process was when you performed blah, 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 blah. And that's a power phrase because it's, it's not threatening. It, you're seeking to get information um, versus being that expert and telling them what to do because it's very short-lived. And it sound, it's not just a power phrase, but it sounds empowering to the person you're saying it to. Make, it gives them some control that they can actually give the leader help. Correct. It makes me feel good if you say that to me, right. rather than having you tell me what to do. Right, and that's very short-lived. And, and they really, if they're not thinking, then there's going to be very, very, very uh, low possibility that there'll be any change of behavior. Mm -hmm. Very low. Uh, on the sales side, a couple of different phrases. 
Um, and I've had many clients over the years say these following words back to me or my power phrases, uh, and it may sound crazy, but the words are, I'm confused. And I'm confused means as you're going through a meeting, um, or I'm struggling, like I mentioned earlier. When you're finding out what the gap is from where that person or person, where they want to be, where they are and where they want to be, to be able to say something like, I'm, I'm a little confused and, and I need your help. Um, you had mentioned earlier that your business was facing this, that, and the other, and that you want to be here but I'm, I'm confused. Don't you think that the way you're handling it now is, is going to be effective enough in order for you to, to get it to that, that point in time without making any changes? And then what that prospect will realize is that they're in a situation where they don't want you to be confused, so what are they going to do? They're gonna help you. Fill in the blanks with their pain, with what's going on. You can have a very open and, and, and very honest conversation about their world because they want to help you. Now, the, the other side of it is what you don't want to be confused on if, they, if you're talking about your product and service. Hey, does your product do this? I'm confused, I don't know. I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> so you got to have to be incredibly knowledgeable in your product and service. Uh, and if you don't know, obviously say you don't know, but um, those are some of the, the most important. Um, either I'm confused or I need, I need your help on the leadership side and or sales side. And you made a good point. I don't know. I'll respect you more oh, yeah. if you say you don't know, but you'll find out for me. And if you just BS your way through it Absolutely. and make something up, because you can tell. Oh my gosh. You can, you'll always know somebody's doing it. And it's that. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I lose trust. For both, yeah. It's all about trust. What about phrases like, I hope this works for you? Yeah. Or I'll try to solve this. Those are, those are tough uh, because they're, they're very they're weak mm -hmm. uh, phrases. Um, there's a lot of times in sales, um, sometimes there's uh, a sales pipeline that's injected with hopium. And hope, <laughs> you know, a lot of hopium problems, uh, hopium addicts out there uh, where there's a lot of hope in that pipeline and um, versus the reality of what's in that pipeline. Oh yeah, they're definitely gonna wanna move forward and, and there's hope. Um, now, with the word try, and I'll talk about both of them in a conversation, try can be, well, well I'll try to do this, or I will try to do that, uh, versus I will do this and I will do that. And I think a lot of, uh, in the sales world, a lot of businesses, they might be hoping for different things, and, and a salesperson might be hoping uh, for a sale, but unless you can actually combine, again, those hard skills and soft skills, to bond and rapport properly with that person, then you're both going to be hoping for something that may not even be a fit to begin with. Mm -hmm. is that, I mean, is that, that's one of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't like those phrases. Uh, sometimes I cringe, because I'll, I'll say them periodically and I'll cringe when I say it. Um, but and so it, it, they're, it's really important to understand what those phrases can do. Mm -hmm. And I even think of, I believe, is better than I hope, because hope is way out there and it may never happen. I believe it's what I'm thinking. Yeah. And I agree, I'll try is assuming, not assuming, but implying that I may be unsuccessful. Right. Why do I want to hear that from you? Right, absolutely, absolutely. And, and when it comes, and I love, before we started I was looking at some of these charts and so much of it talks about language because there is so much language, obviously, in communication. And you can say powerful messages and you can say weak ones. But then there's the how you use your voice. Hmm. And there's the commonly known pattern, at least to me it's very common, but the up talk that I'm, I think this is really a good product for you. And I'm sure you'll be successful if you purchase it. Talk to me about up talk. And, and, and it really applies in the sales environment uh, and in leadership and in general. And it, it's funny because there's, I think there's some that will do up talk a lot more than others. <laughs> and it's when you end it, it almost sounds like a question. Mm -hmm. So it does get confusing. Someone might say, was I just asked a question or, or was that just what it is? Um, I can tell you that it's, 
it can be, it's hard to coach that because a lot of times uh, that person, it's not, it's not impossible, but it's hard because it's so in their DNA how that it just it goes up and up. So what we find uh, on occasion is if they're vulnerable enough to allow themselves to be videotaped mm -hmm. so they can actually see and hear how they do that up talk and then have conversations around how that might affect the prospect. And a lot of times, it, it, I've seen it very clearly. As a matter of fact, there's probably three or four months ago we did this with a, with a client when I was traveling with them. And they looked at the video and they said, I can't believe I do that that often. Mm -hmm. And it, so that in itself was enough to say, now let's talk about how we can work through that. Right. Right. And some of it's cultural. Mm -hmm. Some other languages do have their voice going up and they don't realize when you speak English yeah. what that may be communicating. So of course I'm going to say, it is coachable, Absolutely. because that's what I do. Uh, and, and you have so many other things you need to do, but that's where I get into some of the nitty gritty of communicating. Absolutely. And an interesting story is that my, I was once talking about Uptalk, and I have, Larry and I have three adult children, and so sometimes I run some of my knowledge to them, maybe not listening, but telling, and they disagree with me. Like, if anybody's children know that their children may not agree that you know what, what you're talking about. And I said something to, about uptalk. I mentioned to one of my children that she has a lot of uptalk. And most, many millennials do. It's just become a pattern of speaking. And her response was, that's how you speak in consulting. Like, what? She said, yeah, that, that's how you speak in consulting. You're offering information, but you don't want to be definitive. You want them to give the answer. And I thought, oh my goodness. So I'm, I'm working with a vice president of a major organization. And I'm, I'm coaching him and helping him with his communication. And I said to him, do you realize that you're using a lot of uptalk? And he said, darn, that's back to my consulting days in Boston. And my daughter happened to be a consultant in Boston. And I thought, oh my goodness, maybe there is a time hmm. when lifting your your voice in pitch like a question is effective because you're not the one giving that they're making the decision. So you learn, you learn from other people that sometimes there's an appropriate time to say something. Like, we'd like to shift this organization over here because I'm asking the CEO. I shouldn't be telling him. Mm -hmm. And so I learned that, that yes, uptalk has its appropriateness. Another reason for it is many people do it because they want to let you know I'm not finished. I'm in a meeting and not, people aren't valuing my opinion that much. And so I'm talking like this so you don't interrupt me, but they run the risk of sounding hmm. weaker, sounding questioning and not confident. That's a great point. And so I often tell people, especially women in primarily male workplaces, when they feel like they're never heard, instead of the up talk, you could say, I'm not finished, let me just finish my statement. And then you're not using the up talk, but you're taking control of the situation. So there are times when we Love use that. up talk. And the other thing is, it's an anchor, a period at the end of a sentence. I'm getting on my soapbox a little I bit, but I think yeah. it's really helpful. We have periods at the ends of our sentences. And in India, they call them full stops. Here we call them periods. I wish we called them full stops, because when there's a period, we should stop. Instead of, hi, my name is Linda, and my company is successfully speaking, I'm thinking that I'm linking all my information. Think about what a gymnast does when they get off the equipment. They stick it. We need to stick our sentences That's or we don't cool. sound confident. Absolutely. So, enough about that. But I, I, love that. I think it's yeah. so important because people say, well, there's nothing to do about up talk. Sometimes it's okay, but how can you fix it? And that would be a strategy. Love it. Any other communication styles that you see, Chris, like things that you see with people you're working with that need tweaking? Any thoughts about that? Well, I think it really goes back to knowing what your own communication style is. Um, and, and one of the things that we use uh, with, with all of our clients is, is DISC and understanding what your hardwired behavioral style is. You could be that dominant natural style, that influencer, gregarious extrovert. You could be more of a steady relator, laid back, or more of an analytical type person. And so it's when it comes to communication style, the first place that anyone has to look is themselves. Know what their triggers are. Know what their reactions are. Know what type of other person 
that they may be uncomfortable around. There, there are certain times where, I'll ask the group, have you ever met someone for the first time and you immediately just clicked and you got along? Sure. Have you ever met someone for the first time and it wasn't that? And it was like, hmm. Well, obviously it's their problem, it's not yours. <laughs> you know, right? Of course. Them. <laughs> uh, but that's a difference in style and, you, and it happens immediately. Then when there's that major difference in style, it's up to, to us to be able to recognize, okay, there's a difference here very quickly, and to be able to adjust our styles to more fit theirs in our communication style. So if all of a sudden you meet someone and they're uh, real out there and, and over the top, we may have to adjust our style a little bit. And if we're over the top and someone is very not, we might have to adjust our style a little bit, our tone, to be able to do that. So I think it really goes back to the tenets of communication and understanding how we're hardwired. Understanding when we may get that red blotch in our neck because we're nervous about something, we have to use more energy, we're with someone that may be different than us. I think we have to look at ourselves first. And that's a good point. You're talking about with more language base when yeah. you're talking to people, but what about even the nonverbal? Oh. You know, the person who is closed off, should you be closed off? Or the person who's sitting away, you know, what do you do? Do you, sometimes mirroring somebody with negative postures connects you more. Absolutely. So if I'm sitting like this, you may think, boy, Linda's pretty closed off. But if you do it, we start connecting more because we're mirroring. Or look how we're sitting here, I'm mirroring, right. mirroring body language. So it's, it happens with language, but it happens with the, the nonverbal as well. I couldn't agree more. And, uh, and mirroring and matching, um, and, and it's, it's one of those things that, and I've been in plenty of situations, uh, as, as most of us have, where someone might be closed off, mm -hmm. and you might think to yourself, well, if I do the same thing they're doing, uh, that's gonna be awkward or strange or whatever, but if you actually do the same thing they're doing, all of a sudden, there's a commonality. Uh, the nonverbal and sometimes the mm -hmm. subconscious starts to shift, and you're relating more with that person. So it's really just understanding it's, it's so important, and for a leader, going back to the leadership for a moment, uh, sometimes leaders just manage in mass. They, they, they come to work every day and they just manage in mass without understanding the differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just put a question out to the group. Imagine if everyone in the room, I want to give everyone right now four virtual kids, not actual kids, but four virtual kids. Right? And they are three years old, nine years old, 15 and 21. There you go, I'll take them back, don't worry, I'll take them back in a moment, <laughs> they're virtual. Now, would you speak the same way to all four? No, you would adjust your style, your tone, your nonverbal, and everything to that particular age. A th now, it doesn't mean that a a uh, 15 year old shouldn't be talked to the same as a three year old sometimes, depending on what they're doing. <laughs> but, but, this, but at the same token, we're gonna adjust naturally because of the obvious difference. The problem is, we come to work and we all walk the same hallways, but our realities are different, our styles are different. We have to know our team members, we have to understand them um, and know what they're all about so we can adjust our styles and communicate properly. And know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis right. because what could be one day that they're performing really well, something else may be going on. Absolutely. So taking those moments to really, to really know people. Well, you know what? You don't have those kids anymore. I took them back I took away. Them back. So I just want to make sure you, you took them away. All right, good. And, and when you mentioned age, it reminds me of something else. And, and I was going to ask you about sales presentations because mm. I know you talk a little bit about that and we, we overlap a lot in helping people. So I'd love to know your approach to it. But very often people get in their sales presentations and they don't know their audience. And they're very technical. And so when you mentioned age, it reminded me of something that I often tell people, and I've heard from many other people, especially if you're in science fields, okay, like engineering and you're explaining something. Explain it so either your grandmother would understand it or an eight-year-old would understand it. So you have to be able to I don't want to say dummy down, but make it understandable, or you're not, you can't sell if people don't understand what you're talking about. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit, Chris, about what you tell people about sales presentations and how they should go about it. Absolutely, and there's a, there's a lot of moving parts uh, in, in the process up to the sales presentation. And one of the most important things, Linda, to your point, is 
for a, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, in today's world of technology and email, there's a lot of times uh, where a sales presentation just gets blown by the wayside. What I mean by that is you could talk to a prospect and all of a sudden sit behind the computer and just send out the proposal and be done. And then you're wishing and hoping and, and hoping that, uh, that, that the plans are going to align. If an actual presentation where you're setting it up from the beginning to be able to say, when we, make, when we set up a time to do this presentation, we want to make sure we have the right people in the room, the people that can actually make the decision. And we also, when we present it, we don't want to present things that we never talked about. A lot of times a salesperson will think to themselves, well, let me really, let me add some cool stuff to this. I'll put this in this presentation and I'll really, then it'll really be wowed. But instead, we're doing all the, we're, we're doing presentations or a company will have a template for a presentation, but it's great for an overall template, but it doesn't solve the pains that that particular prospect has. Mm -hmm. So the presentation should go specifically to that prospect Anything you add into it, even though you think it adds value, it gives them something else to think about, and at the end of that presentation, they might be more apt to say, well, you have to think it over, and that can be tough. Now, the actual presentation itself, um, it can come in so many different ways. It can be face-to-face, -face, uh, and in today's technology, with WebEx, GoToMeeting, Skype, to be able to get that other person on, or persons on the other end of the, of the, of the um, the phone of your computer, your face is there, their faces are there, and when you can see each other, your tone, your body language, and, you're go and you're, you know that the, at the end of this presentation there, should, there needs to be a decision, um, and you, you're able to get that decision, yes or no, because of everything that's set up. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing, Linda, is to only present to that specific prospect's pain what is the gap between where they are and where they want to be? Don't add other things in. Um, and, and make sure that, you know, sometimes you don't have to finish the presentation. Mm -hmm. It's another thing we see a lot. I, I have this, I have 19 pages, and I got to get through all 19 pages of this presentation. You may not have to. <laughs> And people don't have attention spans anymore. Our attention span has gotten less and less. They say it's less than a goldfish. Yeah. If you don't have the attention span, and you're giving me this great presentation, Chris, I gloss over after a period of time. Absolutely. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do at my next appointment. And so what was the benefit of that? And if it ends up just being the conversation, that's a great start, too, if right. you know the pain. Right? right. So if you know where to go with it, toss that. Toss Absolutely. that presentation. Absolutely. Specific to them, their needs, what you talked about, and then how that's going to help them in their world. Mm -hmm. So the presentation, because we think of presentation, I'm standing up in front of a room and I have my PowerPoint, so I'm going to give you all the information on why you should <laughs> buy what I have. And that's probably the easiest way to lose mm -hmm. your audience. Not to say we don't Absolutely. use that, but yeah. we have to know how to use it. Yeah. It sounds like you're telling me it's all about people and connecting and the soft skills because it's huge, and, and I love the overlap because everything that you talk about is what I hope to help my individual or even some group clients with because if you don't have the communication, you don't have anything. Absolutely. You cannot not communicate. You cannot not communicate. And it's, and it, it's the, the combination of the hard skills, understanding that it's critically important. And I think that gap is a lot of leaders and a lot of salespeople, anyone in business, the focus is so much on those hard skills showcasing what I know, showcasing how smart I am, mm -hmm. without connecting the dots to the importance of building trust. Uh, because and in sales, you have to get past the preconceived notions that many people have. One thing I'll add to that is at the end, at the end of any sales interaction that a salesperson has with a prospect, ask yourself, what value did I add during that meeting to get that prospect to think about their world in a different way? Or did I just tell them stuff that they could basically see on my website? Mm -hmm. Did I challenge them with questions to allow them to think differently? Because they're inside their world, they're not an expert on whatever you do, if they're outsourcing something or if they're changing vendors. Uh, so it's really focusing on, on them and that requires a tremendous amount of soft skills. 
And you just made me think about even when we're networking, because we're selling ourselves, people always talk about the elevator speech. Mm -hmm. And I, I really hate that term because the elevator speech sounds very one-sided. Mm -hmm. Like, I memorized it, I'm going to say it, and you can tell the person memorized it. But why not have just a conversation or start it with a question? It's, it's right. a parallel. That's how you're taking it to another level and just selling yourself. The question I always ask at the end of these interviews, and, and I think you've answered it in so many ways, but what are some hard facts about soft skills? I think number one is know yourself. Uh, know what style, what communication style you have. Know what type of uh, a person, whether you're a leader uh, or a salesperson that you immediately relate to, and know what can be your kryptonite out there where, where you have issues. And then to be able to be into, and the key is to be able to be in a role, be in that role. Uh, you have to be able to take risks. You have to be able to understand what your comfort zones are because soft skills, um, really it's all about how you can relate to other people. And um, it, it, versus expecting other people to relate to you. And that's probably one of the biggest things. So I think it's, again, it goes back to knowing yourself, um, applying uh, um, in your role what you may do, may, may not be comfortable with, if you start to act on it and ask questions, use active listening, recognize that, then you'll become more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, it's the marrying of hard and soft skills. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And then the listener or the person, the recipient of your information, is going to become more comfortable because you're Absolutely. more comfortable with yourself and, and you know mind. yourself. Yeah. And that's Build all, trust. That's all what it's about. Absolutely. Are there any questions? This has been wonderful. Chris, thanks so much Thank for all you. this information. I could see from looking at a lot of you, there are a lot of great points that he made that resonate with you. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so I teach yoga, and part of our teacher training was talking about like body language, right? And uh, we watched this, I think it was like TED Talks, it was a video about like your power stance. So mm -hmm. if I come in a class and like, hey, you said you today, they're probably not going to listen and they're probably going to want to do like a new class. But if I come in with like a presence like, let's get on the mat, let's get flowing, you know, I have their attention and you know, they're ready to move. And in the TED Talk, um, they did the, the, the power stance, I guess you could say, and they did a study on, okay, everyone's going to go through the same interview process. And then half the group was, you know, sitting very confident. Um, you know, very proud, like sit tall and proud, and the other groups were told to, you know, kind of sit like this, and everyone who wasn't in a confident stance, they weren't offered the so-called job. Um, hmm. So, going back to what you're saying about body language, you know, kind of like mimicking or mirroring what uh, this person is doing, can you, you know, talk, touch on just the power stance? The power stance around that? Yeah, as far as... Amy Cuddy study, right? Yeah. The Amy Cuddy. Possibly, yeah, that's yeah. Because um, it was uh, someone else, like going back to um, someone else's study in the TED Talk. But I guess in regards to presentation or just sitting at a table with someone, how your body language um, would be effective or not effective. Just because there are some things that you said just brought up the question of, well, how does that relate to the power stance? I mean, I, I'll, I definitely I think both of us should talk to that. And I think one of the things is that. It, there is no denying the fact that your body language is such a huge percentage of your overall message that there's, it, it's, it's, I think one, it's a belief system, and a lot of people just don't feel that it's that important. So I think one, it's accepting the fact that it is credibly important, that you'll be able to make an impact uh, on a room by, by owning that, that and, and Jerry Sandusky said that very well as well, owning that, that position you have if you're in front of a room. Um, and if you, if you focus the fact that over half of your, what you're saying comes to your body language, it'll help your message. And, and the study you're talking about, if anybody's seen the Amy Cuddy TED Talk, it's the second most watched TED Talk of all of the TED Talks. Unfortunately, the results of her research have been disputed because they're not replicable. Mm -hmm. Because what she was saying is they were also looking at the chemistry in the brain. Yeah. That if you stand in a power pose for two to three minutes like this, your testosterone goes up and your cortisol, your stress hormone, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, right, your cortisol goes down so you're not as stressed and you'll take more risks in some of the tests. I'll do that before I get 
Right. And and it does work. I mm-hmm. truly believe it works. It's just the chemistry in the brain has not been replicated. Yeah. Be that as it may, and I do this a lot in my public speaking, my master classes, standing with good posture not only makes you look better to the audience and they think you're confident, you start to feel it. Sure. And so I often work, you always say work from the inside out. I sometimes work from the outside in. Right? So if you, you dress the part and feel the part and stand powerful, you just empower yourself and people believe it. The funny thing is I often say you need to have a certain way that you're speaking with confidence. I said you might not if you're, for example, a yoga instructor. So I have to, that, that amuses me that you're even told that. But how you stand is going to make somebody see she knows what she's doing. She's confident. And if you sit like this, which you might choose to because you want to be more passive. Like Chris said, know what you're doing. Just be intentional about it or mindful that you want to be powerful sometimes and other times you don't. And to your point, let me just add one more thing I thought of is that if you want to mirror, if you meet somebody or you want to talk to somebody and you're sitting down and they're standing up, you certainly want to stand up and meet at that level. And I had a boss say to one of my clients, he, she walked into a room to talk to him, and he was sitting at the t- boardroom, and she kneeled down on the floor to talk to him. And he said to her, never, never kneel mm. down to talk to me. Because what did she just communicate? How weak she was. Right. So we can't underestimate. They talk about percentages and studies, and they're not all accurate, but the fact is we know as we watch people, anecdotally, we look at things and we see, yes, body language is huge. If I tried to talk to Chris and the whole time you were closed off, it would be really right. hard for me to connect and ask him questions. Great question. Are there any other questions? Eric? First of all, thank you very much. Uh, Patrick and I were talking earlier about sales and closing and what sales is. So the things that really resonate about what you said today is be authentic, be introspective, be intentional, and the whole chasing of the no. If you manage that expectation up front between you and your prospect so that you have a, uh, a mutual understanding about what this meeting is going to try to accomplish, you might actually be teeing it up to close at the end yes. versus just that uh, merry-go-round of hunting for the yes or the no or chasing it. I'm not really sure that was a question as much as it was just something that's been percolating in my head for the last 35 years. Yeah, and to your, to your point, Eric, it, it's a lot of times it's very difficult to make a decision because a salesperson will not really provide a platform for a prospect to comfortably make a decision, yes or no. And it's that uneasy feeling at the end that, well, we're going to think about it and we'll get back to you. And then it's accepted. Well. Obviously, if I were that person, I'd want to think about it. And that's one of the tough things in sales is that we put ourselves, and, it, and it's almost, that can, not to take it too far, but that can almost be viewed as malpractice. I mean, imagine if a doctor put how they felt about everything onto the patient. And it's really what's best for that patient. So we have to be able to know that we can't sell in the same way we buy. And, and I love what you said, that at the end of that meeting, if both feel comfortable making a decision that here's what a no means, here's what a yes means, and then we can shorten the sales cycle by having a very upfront and candid conversation. Yeah. Continue that thought, I think. Um, sometimes what I find is that uh, the most important thing about for me is making, and sometimes that maybe I haven't communicated enough, is that the decision makers have to actually be there. Or your whole your whole presentation has been wasted because that person can't communicate your sales process to the person that makes the decision the way that you can. Um, so, it's, but I have, do have a question. You had said that um, not adding anything new to a sales presentation that they should know. Could you talk about that a little bit more? They should already know some of the information. There shouldn't be new things. Absolutely. Well, the, the biggest thing with that, Robin, is, is that when you have, when you're qualifying and you're qualifying as to what their needs are, what their pain is, where they want to be, you've also talked about the investment allocation. You've talked about what that 
uh, what they're willing to invest to be able to solve that pain. Is, it, is the pain great enough, uh, strong enough? And then when the, does the investment uh, take care of that pain? And the other part of qualifying is the whole decision-making process. Uh, when it comes to making decisions like this in your organization, typically what I find that there's other people involved in the process. Not sure if that's the case here. Oh yes, we have the, okay, good. So we have pain, money, budget, and decision all talked about before we make a presentation. So those are the reasons for the presentation. When I go back, or when anyone, salesperson A, goes back and puts together the actual presentation, and they think, hmm, let me add this in there. They'll like this, let me put this in there. It actually backfires, because we're thinking we're adding different things, because then all of a sudden they're thinking about different things. They're thinking, well, and I've heard, and I've seen, I've seen this on sales calls, I've seen this when we're doing ride-alongs or, or with the clients. Then sometimes an issue comes up with budget because they're thinking, well, they're throwing this in there. Why don't you just not put that in there and lower the price? There's a, it can backfire in so many different ways. So if you've never talked about it, if it's not a part of it, then, then don't present it. So you like to pre-qualify with the point person and then create a sales presentation where the decision makers now are all... Actually, I like to pre-qualify with everybody, not the point person. Get, getting the decision makers involved in the qualifying process because they deserve to be there. And if we're only qualifying or pre-qualifying with people that can only truly say no and can't say yes, then that's uh, the way that we look, is, is an issue in the sales process. Great question. Yes. Um, when you asked earlier, you know, is sales harder today? I, I was thinking when I see harder is that you have an older workforce across all companies and then what I see is that you have an older workforce trying to sell to a younger workforce. So you see that as a new complexity one with your customers? An older workforce selling to a younger workforce? Yeah, well, it, it, it goes so many different directions. Yeah, so you, this is, that's a great question because then you can look at all the different generations out there. Um, we have uh, the millennials and then, then the, uh, uh, the newest generations coming in that have only been exposed to digital. They don't know anything other than that. So that can be a challenge. And then when it comes to um, really one understanding the other, it, it, it's important to understand that sometimes there's assumptions being made. Well, they're a millennial, so they're going to like this. They're going to like technology. That's not always the case. Or the millennial thinking, well, they're not going to want to, you know, do this on technology, so I won't ask them to, you know, to get on a webinar. Just an example. That's not always the case. Yes, so our assumptions, I don't know about all of you, but typically when I assume, I'm wrong a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, so it's better to really ask. And what do I think of you if you're making an assumption about Correct. me? Why don't you just ask me what right. I'm thinking? What Absolutely. I'm and then that brings in, again, mm -hmm. the soft skills and that mm -hmm. comfort. Because uh, just assuming it can lead to mutual mystification, psychological expectations, and a lack of bonding with that person. Yeah, I tried to avoid the stereotype and just spoke it. It's just an age thing. Oh, yeah. That's really all it is. Yeah. It's not different than it was 100 years ago. No. And some, there are people from each generation who don't act like their generation. So I guess the oh, yeah. point is we all have to be seen as individuals and deal with us, deal with each person separately. This has been, Chris, thank you so much. There are thank so you. many gems of information, and I always learn so much when I interview somebody. So Likewise. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you, Thank you so much. And we still have time here. If you have questions, we can walk, we can stay around here and talk for a little bit.